And welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and let's talk about what I think are probably the most staply cards from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. These are the cards that we're for sure going to be seeing lots of in the Commander format. And, and in the case of a few of these, for sure, Commander staples right out of the gate. Um, definitely, I'll be grabbing a few myself, regardless of what you think of this set, because there definitely are some people that are put off by the theme of this set. There are some really great Commander staples in this set, and not all of them are wearing a cowboy hat. If that bothers you, 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 you can get around it a little bit here, right? Um, there are a bunch of different sets and things going on here, like the big score and different releases for different versions. Uh, apparently, they changed the way they were going to do it at the last minute. I'm just talking about all this stuff all together. So all the cards we're getting whether it be from different scenarios, but all the cards that were spoiled in the last couple of weeks, I'm combining it all into one video, although I will be talking about other cards in another video. So this is the stuff that is for sure gonna see play, and then I'll be talking about probably more fringe or archetype specific stuff in the next video. That being said, we are gonna start out with Forger's Foundry, which is a very archetype specific card for sure, but is just a slam dunk in so many decks that it is going to be a commander staple right out of the gate. Two and a blue artifact, tap at a blue. Whenever you spend this mana to cast an instant or sorcery spell, with mana value three or less, you may exile the spell instead of putting it into owner's graveyard as it resolves. Three blue, blue, and tap, you may cast any number of spells from Mung cards, exile the Forge's Foundry without paying their mana cost, activate only as a sorcery. So this is just such an easy slam dunk in any, is it Spellslinger deck, right? Um, I mean, you could put this in any deck, really. I mean, every deck casts instant sorceries, especially ones in blue. And every deck is going to be playing, likely is going to be playing three mana mana rocks. This mana is blue and can be spent to cast anything. You don't have to spend it to cast instant sorceries. So if you're not casting, if you're just casting your commander, fine. Use this guy as a mana rock like you normally would. So there's really no downside here at all. It's just free value where, I mean, yeah, your opponent could blow it up and then you won't get that last ability. So what? Still a mana rock. It's still doing its job, right? It's just free value. But of course, in an a, is it Spellslinger deck or a mono blue, like a tall run deck? Just an absolute slam dunk. Just lots of free value later in the game. It's certainly going to go in a lot of decks. Sword of Wealth and Power, that's right, we got another sword, even though they completed the series, they don't want to stop because they know people like it. So, three mana, artifact equipment, and of course, equipped to, like every other one of the sword series anyway. Equip creature gets plus two, plus two, and has protection from instants and from sorceries. And of course, this leads me to believe that they're just going to keep doing this, like the next one will be protection from creatures and lands or something, right? I mean, it seems likely that they're going to keep doing that. Protection from instants and sorceries is really good. This is definitely, you know, how does it compare to the other swords? It's up there. Of course, almost all the removal you're going to see is going to be instants and sorceries. So it's going to protect your commander from pretty much any targeted removal. Of course, that's great. It also will protect against a dam, like a Blasphemous Act, obviously, because that is damage from that source. So it's going to protect against that as well. Pretty good. So as far as just I protect my commander against removal, it's almost like giving it Hexproof. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. Hey, everybody loves that, right? When you next cast an instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell, you may choose new targets for the copy. So whenever I'm evaluating these swords, I look at the abilities and I don't expect to use both of them. I still think Sword of Fire and Ice is the best one because that is the one where you're always going to want those two abilities. You always want a card draw. That's great. And you always want to throw two damage around. Those are two things you're always going to be using every single time in a commander game. There's not that many swords that you will always be using both abilities, right? I've seen a Sword of Light and Shadow more times than I can count. A guy gets in for damage with that and there is no creature in their graveyard so they don't get to use that. So it, it's funny how, you know, a lot of swords, the way they use them, and of course, Sword of Feast and Famine is likely the best and likely you will always use be using both of those abilities, although I have argued that most people don't really care about the discard. It's mostly the untapped lands. This is one where you're always going to be getting the treasure token, which of course is good, not great, it's good. Copying the instant sorcery spell can be really good, right? Obviously I get in for damage and then I cast an expropriate. It's probably just game over, right? How often is that going to happen? It could happen. That's a very what ify scenario. I think in most situations, this is just okay. You're likely going to be getting the treasure token, which is okay. 
every time you get in for damage. I will also point out that the other swords, because they give protection from colors, it's easier to get in for damage, where here, your opponents aren't going to be blocking with instance of sorcery, so that doesn't do anything. So it's actually going to be harder for getting, getting in for damage and getting the damage trigger as well. So... Yeah, like this sword, I could think of at least three or four that I would put in a deck over this one. This to me is probably higher on the end of protecting your thing. This is, this is almost like giving your commander hexproof. That's the big advantage here. The getting in for damage part might be a little difficult for you. So for that reason, I would probably bump it down the list a little bit. Let's talk about Claim Jumper. Definitely a card because of course white needs help ramping. Th this is going to be one of the best though. And funny enough, I have my Sofina Lands deck that is purposely trying to have less lands in play where of course this is a slam dunk. How much is this going to be replacing? I don't know. So Claim Jumper, two and a white, Rabbit Mercenary, three, three with Vigilance. When Claim Jumper enters the battlefield, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for a Plains card. And of course, Plains card, very significant there, right? That means I can get a try on with this if I'm in a three color deck. Put it onto the battlefield, tapped. And most people will say, oh, that seems okay for three mana. However, then if an opponent still controls more lands than you, repeat the process once and then shuffle your library. So that means, yes, I can get two lands with this and they can be triomes or shock lands or something like that. Pretty darn good. Is this the best option now for creatures, those white creatures that ETB that get us lands? I'd say it's definitely up there. It is three mana, not two. There are a lot of great two mana, like what Knight of the White Orchid, one that's been used in the format forever. You know, you could debate which is better. The possibility of getting two lands in a play, planes cards for three mana, man, that, that's pretty darn good, right? I, it does have that stipulation that your opponent has to have more lands than you, but that's usually not a huge issue. I still kind of like Stoic Farmer because Stoic Farmer gets you the land no matter what. You know, you can put it in your hand if nobody has more lands than you. So uh, it's debatable, but this is certainly one that's going to see a play and a lot of decks without question. Pest Control, white and a black, sorcery. Destroy all non-land permanents with mana value one or less. And uh, I will be making a video coming up talking about the uh, massive influx of treasure tokens in the commander format and what there is to do about it. I've done that video before. I think I did it about two years ago. I will be doing it again. This will be a card that I will be talking about in that video because of course that's the the first thing you think of, I think. I mean, as the flavor of this card lends towards, you know, rat tokens, sapperling tokens, maybe, right? Pretty neat flavor here. Like if I'm playing a white black deck, I'm just going to throw this in there. It has cycling as well. Cycling to generic mana. So even if by some crazy chance, I don't want to cast it or I can't use it, I can cycle it away. Like this is just an awesome card because it can be an absolute slam dunk in a lot of situations my opponent's playing a whatever token tribal deck which of course there's an absolute ton just in this set alone we already got a bunch but also the treasures the the as i've talked about in so many videos lately food tokens and blood tokens and clue tokens and you know we just got a set that was all about clue tokens it's just an absolute blow in so many situations and if by some crazy chance you can't use it you can cycle it away Certainly going to see play. Great card. Free Strider Lookout. Two and a green. Human Rogue. Three, three with reach. Whenever you commit a crime, look at the top five cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield. Tap. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. This ability triggers only once each turn. And as I've already mentioned, there is very few. I think one or two cards that don't trigger only once each turn. And of course, the reason why is because committing a crime is super easy. Not hard to do. Every You don't have to build around it. Every deck is doing it already. But if you got a commander that is doing it, like built on it, Autumn Willow I'll throw out there. If you're one of those guys that has an old school Autumn Willow deck, and funny enough, that's a, a commander that I used to see all the time. And I was joking about on the Discord, hey, well, Autumn Willow got a heck of a lot better because of course that ability is pay one green mana until end of turn. Autumn Willow can be the target of spells and abilities controlled by a target player as though it didn't have Shroud. So it is very easy for Autumn Willow to commit a crime. Just one green mana, I commit a crime. You're going to pick your opponent, by the way. It's a little dangerous, of course, because you're shutting the Shroud off that your commander has. Used to be this this commander was played quite a bit back in the day as a Voltron commander, funny enough. Times have changed quite a bit. But if you still got that Autumn Willow deck, Free Strider Lookout is a slam dunk there because it is just one green mana, put a land in a play, essentially. You're going to look at the top five cards of your library. If you don't hit a land, that's really unlucky. 
However, it's just one mana if you're in your Autumn Willow deck, or if I'm casting a beast within, you're, you're doing that stuff already. I'm already casting a beast within. If I don't get a land to play, that's okay. I did what I wanted to do already. Likely you're going to get a land. It's not even a basic land. It's any land. Pretty fantastic card. You could, I think, put this card in any deck and get a couple of lands off of it for sure. But obviously in commanders that are committing crimes all the time, it's going to be extra good. Let's talk about the key to the vault. Uh, one of those cards that, you know, it's kind of like that big splashy play possibility anyway. So a lot of people get really excited about cards when they first see it. One in a blue, legendary artifact equipment and has equipped two in a blue. Whenever equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, look at that many cards from the top of your library. You may exile a non-land card from among them and put the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. You may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So it, obviously this is a card you could put in pretty much any deck. There, there are certain decks where I think I would probably try to find room for it. You know, again, we're in a situation now, guys, where I'm talking about 20 cards in this video that you could put in pretty much any commander deck. I'm going to do another video of cards that are more archetype specific that are going to go in all those decks. How are we going to find room for these cards in decks? I could put this in my Abishon deck. Sure, why not? It would be very easy for me to do so. I can activate my commander's ability on the end step. That's one of the great things about that commander, tap down everyone's creatures, and now it's very easy for me to get into damage. That's one of the things that I, that commander allows you to do. So I get a free hit. And even if it's just my commander that has this equipped on it, I get in for damage, look at the top three cards of my library, and I get to cast it for free. Of course I could put it in there. I'm not gonna though, right? Cards like this that could just fit into any deck, for me, I'm gonna start putting in decks where it just, it's a really good fit. Now, where is it a really good fit? I guess if you're in a equipment deck in blue, how many of those are there? I think there are a couple. Certainly you could find room for this. If I have a commander with evasion, like flying could be a really good fit, especially if that commander, like a niv visit, not that you're going to find room in your niv visit deck for this, but you know, you have a, a commander that is flying and also has a pretty big power. You could do some serious damage with this guy, obviously. Even if you weren't planning on attacking with your commander, just free value, right? Probably the best fit for it, I think, and there are a few decks like this, is the I'm reshuffling or looking at the top of my library all the time, right? Any deck where a Sensei's Divining Top is a great fit, this card is also a pretty great fit because, of course, I can set up the card I'm going to get right? Even if I don't have a big creature I'm getting for, I just have a 1-1 one, one I'm getting in for damage with. Now I'm going to look at the top card of my library, but because I can reshuffle the top cards of my library, I'll just make sure there's an expropriate on top or something like that, right? So that's probably the place that I would most find room for a card like this, but it's certainly a lot of people are going to try to find room for this in their commander decks. And I've talked about the Spree cards quite a bit already in my spoiler videos. They are going to be, I think, the most staply cards in the commander format. They're modal, which is, for me, I, I've always loved modal cards in the commander format because you never know what your opponents are going to be doing. So for that reason alone, they're going to see lots of play. There's a lot of reasons they're going to see lots of play. And as I get up towards the, the, the end of this list, I'll be talking about the ones that are going to be all over the place. This one's pretty good though. Requisition Raid, one white mana sorcery, and has the spree ability, which means choose one or more additional cost. You have to choose at least one, and you can choose up to all of them. You cannot choose. We've clarified this on my Discord, I think, enough. We've had quite a few discussions about it. You can't choose them more than once. You can only choose each mode once. So I can choose all three of these if I want to, and they all cost one generic mana. So if I was to choose all three... I would play three generic mana and one. So four mana, that's not bad. So I can pay one to destroy an artifact, one to destroy an enchantment. Of course, we want to be doing that in a commander game always. Also, I can pay one, put a plus one, plus one counter in each creature. Target player controls, which of course is going to be you. Unless, of course, you're in that Nils deck where this would be a slam dunk. So I already need cards in my deck to destroy artifacts and enchantments. And wouldn't you know it, I'm also playing my Lulu deck and I'm putting counters on my creatures, so maybe I'll, I'll replace, like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. It is a sorcery. I know people will knock it for that reason, but man, I, I just, two mana, I destroy an enchantment. If I don't want to do anything else, it's unlikely that I will not also want to destroy an artifact, so why not just throw an extra mana in there? Three mana, destroy an artifact and enchantment. That alone is pretty good, right? And also, I can throw one more mana in there and just put a counter on all my creatures. That seems pretty good. If you're in any 
theme in white that is doing the plus one, plus one counter theme. I think it's probably a slam dunk. If you're in any theme in white where I just have like, you know, soldier tribal or, you know, a lot of little creatures where maybe I want to beef them up a little, probably also a great fit. I think it's going to go in a lot of decks. Let's talk about Return the Favor, the red spree option that I'm talking about. I think this is the best red one. I think white for sure made out the best with, with as far as the spree spells. And in fact, I think white made out the best in this set entirely, which we've been seeing that a lot lately. This is the best red one, in my opinion. So red and a red instant and has the spree ability. I can pay an additional one generic mana, copy target, instant spell, sorcery spell, activated ability, or triggered ability. You may choose new targets for the copy. Tag, that's pretty good. So this isn't just copying instants of sorceries like you typically would with those red effects that do that. You can also copy activated and triggered abilities that can be really, really good. And of course I can choose my opponents or I can choose mine. I can also copy my own trigger and activated abilities, which could be really, really good. Especially if you have a commander that has a really great activated or triggered ability. This is just that ab ability triggers an additional time, right? For three mana, that might be really good. Also though, I can pay one, change the target of target spell or ability with a single target. So now I can do that deflecting SWAT thing. And again, not just spells, also abilities. And of course I can combine them. So for four mana, my opponent casts a Swords to Plowshares. Just let's go with the most basic scenario here. I am going to pay four mana. I am going to copy it. I mean, this essentially becomes a Wild Ricochet, right? Which costs four mana. So it's already better than Wild Ricochet, right? Because not only am I copying the swords and removing some creature I don't want on the table, I'm also going to change the target of the original swords. So now for four mana, I get to exile two of the most threatening creatures on the table, and I'm also saving mine. Again, we're already doing that, but this also is copying activated and triggered abilities and redirecting activated and triggered abilities. So fantastic. I love dealing with activated and triggered as abil abilities. For me, I don't have any of the wild ricochet that the ones that used to get played in the format all the time. I don't really play those much. Maybe I should. They are pretty good. I really like the idea of also being able to deal with activated and triggered abilities. You would be surprised how often you will lose games because of an activated or triggered ability. It does happen a lot. I mean, just think of Aetherflux Reservoir. Aetherflux Reservoir, your opponent pays 50 life to shoot you in the face. You redirect that activated ability back at them, and then you copy that activated ability and knock someone else out. I mean, that seems like a pretty good play, right? I think it's a great card. Let's talk about Fleeting Reflection. This is one I've already talked about. I think it's a really neat card. I love cards like this that can do so much. One in a blue instant target creature you control gains hexproof until end of turn. Very usable. Untap that creature. Also very usable. Until end of turn, it becomes a copy of up to one other target creature. And as I incorrectly said in that video, you don't have to turn it into another creature. It is up to one other target creature. So if I have that Arcanus, and I think there's a slam dunk in that deck, my opponent goes to remove it. I give it Hexproof and untap it so that I can draw three cards. And I don't have to turn it into something else if I don't want to but I can turn it into something else if I want to, right? Now my opponent plays a Blightsteel Colossus. I have some dinky creature, Wood Elves sitting in play. I can now turn my Wood Elves into a Blightsteel Colossus and kill someone. That seems pretty good. I can also use it to save my commander, untap a creature. I just, I just love it. This car is doing so much for two mana at instant speed. I think it's great. Let's talk about Red Rock Sentinel. And I was going to talk about this one in the next video because it is kind of archetype specific, but eh, I think it's pretty good. Three mana artifact creature, Golem 2-4 with Defender. Pay two and tap, sacrifice a land, draw a card and create a treasure token. So I, I guess, and of course I have a sacrifice land themed deck that this is absolutely going to go in. And any deck like that, probably a great slam dunk. You're getting the treasure token and the card draw. But later in the game, it, to me, this just seems like, like even a land fall deck probably would love to have this guy because you're just putting lots of lands in play that later in the game you probably don't even really need and you just turn those extra lands into a card draw and a treasure token so yeah this does seem pretty archetype specific but i think this is going to see a lot of play because I, I think it can fit you know in any deck that you just might have trouble drawing cards you might want to throw this guy in there and i guess if you're creating treasure tokens as well you might want to throw this guy in there because you're getting double whammy here right 
pretty good card, I think. Vareska joins up and we have a, a bunch of these. This is the one that I think is the best. Black and a green legendary enchantment. When Vareska joins up, enters the battlefield, put a death touch counter on each creature you control. And that's why I think it's the best one of the cycle, simply because it is surprisingly difficult to give all your creatures death touch. Now, th this doesn't actually give all your creatures death touch because of course the creatures that come afterwards won't have death touch, but you know, giving your whole team death touch is really, really hard to do. And this is a way that you can do it and only for two mana. So that alone, I think is pretty good. Whenever a legendary creature you control deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. Also pretty fantastic. So you can, if you want to just put this in your deck to give your commander death touch. And also when it gets in for damage, you get to draw a card. So that alone is pretty good. Probably a slam dunk in a Skullbriar deck, right? I think it's obviously going in there because it's doing the counter thing and also you're getting in for damage all the time. So there, there's definitely some commanders where it's going to be an absolute auto-include, but all around pretty good card. Voracious Varmint, a card that probably would be overlooked. I would say this is my sleeper pick from the set. One and a green creature Varmint. I guess we have Varmints now in the commander format or in the game of magic. 2-2 two, two with Vigilance. Pay one, sacrifice Voracious Varmint, destroy target artifact or enchantment. That's it. It's just another one of those creatures, but it might be the best. I think about the ones that I used all the time, like Caustic Caterpillars when I used. That only costs one mana, but the activation costs two. And for me, the activation cost is more important because because you want to do it in that moment, right? In the moment of, I got to get that artifact off the battlefield. I got to get that enchantment off the battlefield. Caustic Caterpillar is going to cost me two, where this is only going to cost me one, right? Uh, we also have Cosly Pride Mage, but Cosly Pride Mage is white and green. This is only green, so it fits in more decks. I don't know if it's the best version of this, the, the creature I sacrificed to destroy artifacts and enchantments, but it, it it's right up there as one of the best creatures that do that now, I think. Speaking of getting stuff off the battlefield, Boombox. I don't know if anyone thinks this card's any good. I think it's pretty good. Again, colorless options are really important. Two mana artifact, pay six. I know that sounds like a lot. Tap, sacrifice, boombox, destroy up to one target artifact, up to one target creature and up to one target land. So you can get an artifact creature and land with this. I know people will say eight mana to get the na 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 na. It really drives me crazy when people say that. Like I just said, in the moment is what matters most. I just play this on turn two, right? I'm playing my, I mean, colorless deck. I'm going to be putting this in my colorless deck, my Omarthus deck. Turn two, I'm just, eh, play a boombox. It just sits there, right? No one's going to use the removal on this. I seriously doubt anyone's going to use the removal on this. It just sits there. And then in the moment when I have to get a certain creature off the battlefield or a land, maybe my opponent just played a Cabal Coffers or a Gaius Cradle, now I can sacrifice this and I'll also hit the best creature on the battlefield and the best artifact on the battlefield. It's not super fantastic. It is a colorless option for hitting all three of those things, which I think is pretty darn good. This for sure could go in some decks, obviously the colorless ones, but man, even a mono green deck, a mono green deck doesn't deal with creatures very well. This could be an option for a mono green deck. Definitely doesn't have a problem getting lands into play. So the cost of this isn't gonna be so much of an issue. You might wanna give it consideration, maybe, just saying. Ruthless Lawbringer is definitely a much, much better removal option and a much more versatile one. That is for sure, again, th this is one of those things where if you're just playing these colors, it goes in there. One white and a black Vampire Assassin 3-2. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature when you do destroy target non-land permanent. So it is a three mana Vindicate on a creature, essentially. I mean, I guess it doesn't hit lands, but it's essentially a Vindicate stapled on a creature. You have to sacrifice another creature. That's not super difficult. And obviously there's a lot of Orzhov decks that want to be sacrificing creatures already. So this is an absolute slam dunk in those decks. You know, I would say Aristocrats decks is it 100% goes in there. The Vampire, maybe Assassin Tribal, but Vampire Tribal decks in white and black absolutely goes in there. And then we go down from there and it, it's, it goes in a lot of, like I would probably put this in a white black deck for sure. The fact that it's stapled on a creature, again, we can get it back out of the graveyard. We can blink it, whatever, you know, all those scenarios. Maybe you're playing an Athreos deck, right? The Athreos deck that gets your creatures back probably seems like a slam dunk there as well. I guess the other Athreos deck is also a pretty good fit there as well, right? So it just fits in so many themes. Obviously destroying a permanent staple on a creature is going to go in a lot of decks. Rackus Entertainer, one and a green, plant bard, two, two. Pay one and tap, put a plus one, plus one counter on each creature you control that entered the battlefield this turn. 
So this is, I guess, an Orin Reef, the vast wood, right? Sort of. It is definitely going to go in a lot of decks. I would say you could definitely put this in a plus one, plus one counter deck, which almost all plus one, plus one counter decks are green. So, you know, even if I just pay one and tap this to put a plus one, plus one counter on the one creature that entered the battlefield turn this turn, that's totally worth it. Nothing wrong with that, right? You don't have to put it on 20 creatures. Just putting it on one is good enough. But of course, where this really gets out of hand is the situations where I can I dump a whole bunch of creatures. Tokens, probably. I, I would definitely lean towards I'm playing a token theme. I just played my Avengers and a card. And, and then I play one and put a bunch of counters on all of them, right? The, the, those scenarios. The token theme, I like it. Like, I got a Rasta deck. That would be a good one. You know, there's a commander that's a little underwhelming that maybe could use a little bit of help. This seems like a great fit there where I have, you know, some, my, one of my opponents cast an instant. I create that spider token and then I put a counter on it. That seems like a pretty good fit there, right? So a lot of decks that I think are going to love having a card like this. Getting to the top of the list and the cards that I am, I think we're definitely going to see a lot of. Bandit's Hall is a pretty good one. Three mana artifact. Whenever you commit a crime, put a loot counter on Bandit's Hall. This ability triggers only once each turn. So again, with that, but again, I don't think it's very hard to do so. Tap, add one mana of any color. So again, we're in that sphere of, I have a mana rock that's color that is three mana that fits into that slot, adds one mana of any color. We have so many now, Patriarch Seal, Decanter of Endless Water, Dark Steel Ingot, if you're still playing that. Um, you know, I think a lot of people probably play Chromatic Lantern that don't really need to. You know, I don't think you really need to play that card unless you're like in a five color deck. You, you might very easily be able to slot out one of those cards for a card like this, right? The added value that I'm getting, is it going to work out really nicely for me? And I think in a lot of cases that would happen with Bandit's Hall. Pay two mana tap, remove two loot counters from Bandit's Hall, draw a card. So it just becomes a card draw. And I would say later in the game when you probably need it more, right? The reason I like this card and why I, I'm, I'm contemplating putting it in decks. I, I have to look at what decks do I have a three mana rock that I can swap this out very easily where what it's doing is, eh, it's just okay. I don't really need a Patriarch Seal that bad, or I don't really need Maxim Hand Size. I don't need that so badly. This might be better for me. I'm just going to be tapping this for mana as, as you would do with any mana rock. Again, just like I talked about with the first card in this video. And again, the committing a crime thing is just going to happen. I'm casting a Swords on one of my opponent's creature, casting a Beast Within on one of their artifacts. I'm doing, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And I'm just slowly piling counters on this as the game goes on. And then now we're on like turn seven or eight. I got a bunch of counters on this and I my hand's getting empty and now I can start using it to draw cards. So I think it's a pretty easy slot in. Yes, of course, if you are committing a crime all the time, you know, a Hanada deck, as a lot of people have mentioned, there's a commander that it's not actually targeting anything, but sure as heck, you're going to be doing it a lot in that deck. This is definitely a mana rock I would throw in that deck because it's going to be piling counters on it. And later in the game, I can just start using it to draw cards. Two mana draw cards, pretty good, right? Probably a, a card that I think, because it's colorless especially, can fit in a lot of decks. All right, again with the spree cards, these, these next three are all spree cards. They are going to be the most chase cards from this set, I think. Uh, they're all kind of getting a little up there in price already. They're certainly going to see a ton of play in the format. Three Steps Ahead is the best blue one for sure. One blue mana instant, has the spree ability, and the options are one in a blue, counter a spell. There's something you want to do in every commander game. Three generic mana, create a token that's a copy of target artifact or creature you control. Again, something that, you know, maybe some decks want to do a little bit more than others, like my Tashana deck is already doing that, but you always want to do that in a commander game, right? Two generic mana, draw two cards and discard two cards. So again, something that you always want to be doing. And, and again, there are some scenarios where maybe you want to be looting. Maybe you want throwing things in your graveyard. Certainly there are decks that are, want to be doing that more, but these are three modes that every commander deck wants to be doing. And of course you can do them all. And, you know, as I talked about in the spoiler video, maybe I'm playing my Tashana deck and I'm planning on using this to create a, a token copy of one of my creatures, but oh, my opponent just cast a Cyclone Rift. So eh, maybe I'll just counter that, right? I'll use that mode instead. I'm not going to use them both because I don't have the mana. That's okay. I just save my arse by countering that Cyclonic Rift. Maybe I want to use it to loot because I have to get something in my graveyard. Maybe I can do them both. 
I guess if you want to do all of these, what is it? Three, four, five, six, and two blue. <laughs> That's eight mana. That's a lot, eh? Yeah, you're likely not going to do that. Although it is instant speed, so it, you know, it is a possibility. Certainly, this card is going to go in a bunch of decks. For me, I, you know, I, before I was thinking, am I going to start just taking counter spells out of my deck and replacing it with this? It's actually not a super great counter spell, right? I don't really want to take out an offer you can't refuse, which is my favorite counter spell in the format, and replace it with this because it costs at minimum three mana, right? So I've just replaced my counter spell that is, is one of the best options in the format with one that is really bad. Three mana counter spell is terrible, right? I don't think I'm going to do that though. I don't think I'm just going to take out a counter spell in all my decks and replace it with this because the counter spell option is obviously if I'm taking out a counter spell, that's the option. I've now taken out a good counter spell for a really bad counter spell. I'm not going to do that. I would advise against that. I would be careful, right? You you could end up screwing yourself where man, I really needed a counter spell, and now I have a really bad counter spell, which this is. However, I am definitely going to find room for it in a few of my decks where it actually fits. Again, that for me, I like to find room for card, like in a deck where I want to loot, I will put this in, and in a deck where I want to create token copies of stuff, I will put this in for sure. Insatiable Avarice, however, is a card that you could pretty much put in any deck, and this to me, you know, it, it's a toss-up over these next two cards, which is going to be the, the most po popular from the set. And I think it might be this one, because this one is the one that is the easiest slot into any deck and has no, you're not downgrading at all, right? Like with three steps ahead, you can, you end up downgrading your counter spell or, or maybe you downgrade your draw spell by putting that in. Whereas with Insatiable Avarice, I think this is actually a really good tutor. And I also think it's a really good draw spell. So you wouldn't be downgrading anything with this card. So that's why I think it might be the, the best card from this set. So one black mana sorcery, but has the spree ability. You can pay two generic mana, search your library for a card, and then shuffle that card and put it on top. So this is a three mana tutor. Put it on top, but still, that's a good tutor option. Nothing wrong with this. People are already doing that. So that is a really good tutor option in the commander format. And also you can pay black and a black target player draws three cards and loses three life. So three black mana, draw three cards. That's a really good draw option in the commander format. So I can very easily, and if you're still playing sign in blood, it is super easy and I recommend you do just take those and replace it with this because now I have a, in my opinion, better draw spell and also it's a tutor option. And of course I can do both, right? Later in the game, I can pay two and three black, so five mana to draw three cards and search for a, a card out of my library. And if, for all those wondering, these resolve in order. So what I'm going to end up doing is searching and then draw three cards. So of course, the card I just searched for will end up in my hand. So it gets even better in that scenario. This card's great. I, I think this is probably the best card from this set. And it's the one that probably long-term we will end up seeing in the most decks. Final showdown, maybe might be more popular. People are certainly losing it over this card. It is the one, eh, maybe it's the most buzzworthy card from this set so far. Again, I think white made out the best in this set. This is certainly one of the cards that is making that argument. So one white mana instant has the spree ability. One generic mana, all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn. So for two mana, I can make all creatures lose all abilities. That can be great. Really, really great in a lot of situations. One white mana, choose a creature you control. It gains indestructible until end of turn. Obviously very usable. I need to save my commander in a pinch and I can do so. Also, three white, white, destroy all creatures. And, uh, you know, the, obviously six mana board wipe is just destroying all creatures isn't great. But of course, it is instant speed. A six mana board wipe at instant speed is pretty good. That is totally worth it. I don't love a board wipe that just destroys all creatures and there's no other stipulation. It's not giving me a huge advantage. However, being able to cast it on my opponent's end step is the advantage because then I can untap on my turn. And yeah, all my creatures got destroyed too, but because I'm doing it at instant speed, that's the advantage for me. So I untap on my turn and now I can refill my board before anyone else does. So there's the advantage. Also works with all the other abilities. And as I pointed out with the last card, they resolve in order. So what's going to happen if I pay all of these? So again, I'm paying what? Eight mana total. That's a lot. But again, at instant speed, I can have all other creatures lose abilities. So if my opponent has indestructible creatures, they will lose those abilities. And then the choose a creature I control will gain indestructible. So I can pick my commander to have indestructible. So lose all abilities, then my creature gains indestructible, my commander, then I destroy all creatures. 
So that is a big advantage there. It's sort of like a Dune Blast, right? It ends up working out like a Dune Blast, which costs seven mana. So this is, is very similar there. Instant Speed Dune Blast, pretty good, right? Awesome card, obviously. And this is one, unlike Three Steps Ahead, where, again, this is more like Insatiable Avarice, where it's just super easy for me to take out a card that is doing one of these things. Obviously, the creature's losing abilities. I don't know if I have any cards in my decks that do that currently, but certainly I have cards that are protecting my stuff and destroying creatures. So this is one where I will look at what I have. And, and again, this is the advice I give to you guys. How many board wipes do I have in my deck already? If I'm at the minimum, and for me, three is the minimum. If I'm at the minimum, then I, I, I might not take out a board wipe to put this in. I'm probably going to replace my blacksmith skill with this maybe, right? Give a creature indestructible. Uh, you know, it's not as good, but it's also got a bunch of other stuff. If I'm at four board wipes in my deck, which of course I have decks that do have four board wipes, I might just replace a board wipe with this, right? So it depends on where you are with your deck. Certainly, this is a card that could possibly be the most popular in the format. Again, I think Insatiable Avarice might be better, more generically good. Let's put it that way. This is certainly a great one. Not my favorite card from the set though. My favorite card is Nexus of Becoming. Just a really unique, interesting card. These are the cards I kind of love when you see them in new sets that there's just a lot of neat little things you can do with them. So six mana artifact at the beginning of combat on your turn, draw a card. Hey, that's pretty good. Then you may exile an artifact or creature from your hand. If you do create a token, that's a copy of the exiled card, except it's a 3-3 Glim artifact creature token in addition to his other types. Just a neat card that's doing a really neat thing. It is kind of generic good stuff. You could put this, of course, it's colorless. You could put it in any deck. Um, I honestly don't know how popular this card's going to be. There is a lot of the cards from this big score set that are very archetype specific, and I will be talking about a bunch of them in the next video. Again, I, I leaned towards the more archetype type specific cards in that video here. I'm talking about the ones that are more generically good and could fit in almost any deck. And this is certainly one that you could put in any deck. You always want to be drawing cards. So at the beginning of combat, my turn, I draw a card for six mana. That's not great. I, I guess in a, a deck, like a colorless deck where you don't have a lot of great draw options, it is not a bad one. Like Staff of Nin, there is a six mana card that is drawing you cards, right? So uh, in fact, I might even have that in my colorless deck, right? Your options aren't great. So a six mana card that is just drawing you a card, that's already good. So it's already an easy slot in there, but then you can do some really funny things and you may exile an artifact, a creature from your hand. The fact that you can turn an artifact into a creature, you might get into some funny scenarios there. Like, like that's the part where I really like this card, where I can get into some really funny, interesting scenarios here. Again, going through my list of, stuff that I can use this for. Uh, like, I'll just go down my li my list of decks just to throw out some funny ideas. I have my In Name is One deck where I have certain creatures that I certainly would be okay with turning them into a 3-3 Golem Artifact creature token. Like, for example, my Kokusho, right? Do I care if that's a 3-3 Golem? Or no, I don't. I, the ability is what matters there. My crew pit lord, as I just demolished my patrons in my last game with, that that is a fantastic ability where I can just create a token copy of that guy and then I get to pay one life to give a creature minus one, minus one to lend a turn. Do I care that it's a three, three artifact? No, I don't. The ability is what matters, right? So that is a great way to essentially cheat a really great ability into play if you don't care how big the creature is, right? ETB creatures work really good here as well. Again, my Tashana deck, I don't know if I'm actually going to put this in there, but my Teshana deck is an ETB deck, another deck where this could work really, really well, where now I can draw a card, exile my Rex Sage. I put a copy of that into play. It's actually bigger, but of course, the main reason I want it is for the artifact enchantment removal, which I will get. I put, you know, whatever, just go down the list of great ETB creatures I have in that deck that I can put directly into play and get the ETB trigger. Do I care it's a 3-3? No, I don't, right? So just great value. It's a really value -y card, which I like a lot. And also it is a, you can get to some really fun janky scenarios with it as well. Just a really neat card in the commander format. I like to see cards like this in new sets. All right, there you go. There are the, I think I have 20 cards here that I talked about. Those are the ones that, I don't know if they're necessarily my favorites from the set, but they're definitely the ones that are going to see probably the most play in the commander format. I will be making a video about the commanders obviously as well. So I'll be doing that video coming up and I'll be doing another video talking about some more 99 cards that are a little more archetype specific and a little more fringe and a little more janky, but I, I still think they deserve to get a mention. You guys let me know in the comments below what are your favorite cards from this set. That is it for today, though, and thanks for tuning in.